So for civil society, because we have been out there to create awareness, build the capacity of citizens, they find that to be very unwelcome. <laughs> Government is disturbed by the growing trend of politically motivated false abductions in the country which are calculated to put government in negative light. We want to give peace a chance. We want to give dialogue an opportunity so that we create hope for the people of Zimbabwe. Welcome to this edition of Free Talk, brought to you proudly in partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. And I'm your host as always, Dara Blessed Mklang. Zimbabwe goes for an election in 2023, general election, and already we have seen scenes of violence. But apart from the physical violence, there's something that is now being called the harvest of fear, where people fear the yesteryear uh, aspects of violence, abductions, human torture, and violence towards election. Now, to, we want to discuss this issue, and joining me uh, this evening is none other than the ZPP pro, uh, director and veteran broadcaster Justina Mkoko, also a victim of political violence who has lived through abduction, torture. And we speak about these things and their effects on Zimbabwean electoral discourse. Now, thank you very much, Justina, uh, and, and welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me, blessed. Amen. Now, just, let us just talk about, just as an introduction, the scenes of violence that we have seen in the past few weeks. What do this do as we Zimbabwe heads to an election? I think the first thing that we conclude from what we have just seen in the last few days is that we are in election mode. And um, I think this is how elections have gone on in Zimbabwe. But we have also seen elections going on without the kind of violence that we are seeing now. So it's possible for Zimbabwe to go towards an election without the scenes of violence that we have just witnessed. But is it, is it what, what effect really does it have um, to those who I want to register to vote and those who are affected by the violence? The scenes that we have just seen, blessed, um, stopping other political players to be in the game of politics. Because by getting into politics, it means that they need to be able to access communities. But what we have just seen is a deliberate effort to stop them from uh, getting into the business 
um, for which they were formed. For me, that's a violation of human rights. On the part of the uh, political players that were involved, and also on the part of citizens, because citizens are having their rights to freedom of association and freedom of assembly being um, um, violated. There are some who have said that this is stage managed because the UN Special Rapporteur is coming into the country and we have these actions. Now, in, you lead the PP and you uh, get this data, you look at these things. Is there evidence to suggest that this was a stage managed? That is a very tired narrative, blessed. And I wish whoever had started that narrative needs to stop that narrative because it's not doing them any good. One official was saying it's stage managed and another official within hours of each other was actually confirming that uh, ZANU-PF supporters had been provoked. So there was no stage management because um, they were actually coming out to say they wanted to block Nelson Chamisa from getting into the areas that he wanted to get into. So the issue of stage, we have had this even in terms of abductions, that uh, when an international official is coming, when an international meeting is happening, there is uh, stage managing of, um, of events. I think that they need to work on a new narrative because that is not working anymore. And we are also aware that there is, they are promulgating a law yes. that's supposed to um, work towards that. But I think it's evident in terms of their strategy um, that uh, it's all coming out, that all this was planned well ahead of Nelson Chamisa's visit to Mashiko. But why would he plan a visit when he knows the UN rapporteur is coming? Why not? Does the UN rapporteur stop people from breathing? Does the UN rapporteur stop people from going on with their business? I don't think so. Because if he did that, then we would be told that since the UN rapporteur is coming, everything comes to a standstill. How can, it, how can they want things to come to a standstill for other actors and continue for their own? As you speak about these other actors, is there a balance that makes sense for you in terms of um, fair playing field? Um, because we have seen the application of COVID regulations. Is, is it fair in your view? It is not fair at all. What we have seen since March 2020 is that we have seen the lockdown of human rights. We appreciate there was supposed to be a lockdown in response to the global pandemic. But it did not mean that rights also needed to be locked down. Because what we saw was uh, state security agents actually perpetrating a lot of violations against citizens. Do you have, do you have evidence for this all? Yes, we do. In terms of numbers, we do have evidence that we actually saw state security agents becoming the main perpetrators of human rights violations during the period that we were under lockdown. And what we also saw, I think you are also aware that uh, uh, the, the number of civil society people and also the number of opposition actors who have cases before the courts for uh, violating lockdown regulations are quite high. But you have not heard of any from ZANU-PF actually being arraigned before the courts. Because what we have seen is a selective application of the law. We have heard that this Second Republic is actually better in terms of human rights. And now you're saying something different. I am not sure where you are getting that, but uh, I'm sure you never got it from me. Because what we have seen with the Second Republic, I was actually shocked the other day when I listened to um, 
the, the political commissar, uh, Patrick Chinamasa, speaking about the last people uh, heard of Guns. firing in the AA was actually the, the liberation struggle. It was like he had forgotten or he was suffering some amnesia because we had guns through Gukurawundi. And uh, if we want to come closer to this period, August um, 1st, 2018, um, the shots actually did not go to the air. They were directed at civilians and six people lost their lives. Um, evidence in terms of that, the Mosante Commission came in and uh, we are aware of their report that also confirms that there are people who lost their lives and many more who were injured. Fast track to January 2019, um, more than double the number from August 1 were gunned down during the fuel increase um, protests that happened. So Zimbabweans have actually been instilled with fear as a result of guns being used all the time. But what verdict do you then do we give Emerson Dambuzomnangagwa as a president, Robert Gabriel Mugabe as president, human rights in the center? Where do we oscillate to? Are we also forgetting that Emerson Mnangago was also part of the Robert Mugabe system at a very high level as well? So for me, it's that just uh, a change of label, but he was part of that system uh, during the years that the late Robert Mugabe was at the helm. So he's aware of the ins and outs in terms of what was happening during that system. And we see a continuation of that happening. But I think for, for me and others, the concern is the brazen nature of the violations that we are, that we are seeing. Mugabe was subtle, is that what you're saying? I am not really saying subtle, um, but I'm saying um, during Mugabe's era, yes, we saw Gukuraundi during that time. But after that, I think he was trying to kind of hide behind the finger. If guns were used, they were probably used um, where not many people would see. But what we saw August 1 and uh, January 2019 was actually live ammunition being used on the streets of Harare. Let us look at the effect i mean as we really go to the election have we had any quantification or attempt to quantify to say how is this going to affect whether the result that we will get in 2023 would be free fair and credible um i think what we are seeing at the moment is actually making the playing field unlevel and as soon as the playing field is unlevel, there is no way that you can speak about uh, freeness and fairness because there is fear that is being instilled in people who are supposed to go and express and also enjoy their political rights. Some of them might actually be disenfranchised by the fear that um, ZANU PF is harvesting at the moment. Is there an outlet valve? Is there an opportunity that these things can be remedied? An opportunity is there. I think um, our leaders, the political leaders, need to rein in their supporters. But before they even go to their supporters, they also need to do a self-reflection um, in the sense that we see hate language actually driving um, violence that eventually affects citizens. So they can actually do away with hate language. Um, 
our environment is laden with hate language and uh, it should not have a place where we are aspiring to be a democratic society mm. and um, i also believe that if they see that this is being done by overzealous supporters they need to rein in those supporters because without punitive measures or um, accounting for actions that the supporters would have um, would have done will not go, do, do good to anyone everyone needs to have their day in terms of ensuring that we are encouraging um, peaceful contests we know the contest is supposed to be there but there needs to be an enabling environment but president emerson Mnangagwa has always when he delivers his speeches and talks at rallies he calls for peace is that not enough calling for peace is very different from taking action to ensure that peace exists we are not going to get peace from rhetoric so we need our leaders to move away from rhetoric to action at the moment you think it's just rhetoric with what we saw recently i think it is and when we are looking at the violence that is within zanu pf itself i'm also thinking that the message is not getting anywhere so we might actually be having a problem that needs to be sorted out because it's not just the inter-party violence that is worrying us but it is also the intra-party violence that we are seeing at the in the elections that they are holding as a party how come on the legislative agenda uh, justina there is there was a principle that was approved by cabinet recently targeting at civil society organizations i'm sure you are aware of it mm -hmm. does this worry you which one specifically are you talking recently about? they spoke about registering uh the about uh, living uh, uh civil societies mm -hmm. Uh, deregistering, giving powers to the register to either deregister, deal with the board and all those powers. Do those worry you? Yes, they do worry me in the sense that what we are recognizing is that the walls in terms of the operating space of civil society organizations continue to go up and they are actually suffocating the air in terms of our being able to operate. The challenge that we are seeing is that government sees us as their enemy. I think they need to move not? from, I, we are not an enemy of the state. Those are labels that they want citizens in the country to believe. The work that I am doing in communities is work that actually complements what government is doing. Because if I'm reporting on human rights violations that have been perpetrated by people who are supposed to be protecting citizens, government should be worried because they need to be asking the question, who will guard the guards if the police are going to be perpetrating um, violence? But then what we have recognized is the conflation of state and the ruling party. And as a result, that kind of moves the police in terms of them being able to fulfill their mandate according to the Constitution. Are you saying that the police are compromised? They are complicit in the violations that we are recording. You've been accused of receiving money from hostile nations. In fact, uh, at a press conference that you're talking about, uh, uh, the uh, Zanu PF acting political commissar said he will soon be writing uh, a directive to party members naming NGOs saying do not deal with this. Is, what does this message send to you in the civil society uh, circle? Not you as a PP but the civil society as a whole. Uh, the work that we do needs to be funded. Um, and uh, I believe it's nothing that's new to government.
that uh, we do receive uh, funding. Um, but we are also aware that for some work within government, they are also receiving money from those same governments that they are labeling. Does it become tainted when it comes to civil society? And it's clean when they are receiving it to assist with health, to assist with uh, providing food for communities that might actually be in need of food. The same krona that they are getting, I suppose, is the same krona that we are also getting. And it was the same krona that the nationalists were getting during the liberation struggle. So you're saying these allegations are without base? I would say so, because if I am doing work within this country, um, work that has um, an objective of upli uplifting citizens of this country, I don't see anything wrong. Just when um, the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum challenged uh, Malaba, Justice Malaba's reappointment, there was a letter that came from the Minister of Justice, Ziambi Ziambi, saying that we have to look the enemy in the eye. It's time to poke the enemy in the eye. Now, these are some of the works that are accused the NGOs of trying to destabilize this country. Does that have base? Um, it's unfortunate that such hate language is used against civil society. If you're going to talk about poking the eye, for me that is violence. None other than violence. But when we look at the process in terms of the challenge before the courts, that's a process that is allowed according to our constitution. There was then a citizen who then challenged the ruling of the High Court. Why did they not speak about poking the eye of that citizen? But these are situations that are allowed by our own constitution. Why should we be um, made to be afraid of taking these steps that are actually allowed by the constitution? I want to take you to the victims of violence and let's talk about those. You have been a victim yourself. Mm -hmm. But first of all, I want to talk to those that you work with. Mm -hmm. what, what have you, have been the effect of this violence in their lives? Have they ever managed to heal from that? The sad thing, blessed, is that some of those people have actually lost their lives. And that has had a devastating effect to their families. Some of them have been um, injured, maimed for life. And every time they look at those injuries, they actually recall what happened to them. Some struggle to be able to take a decision. Do I seek redress in this situation? for fear of reprisals, because they have seen that happening to other people. But we have also found others who have had the confidence to challenge such situations. And we have evidence in the courts where people have actually been um, granted damages because of the violations that they have faced. I think one other unfortunate situation is that when I'm talking about families, you might think I'm just talking about adults in families. But we are also talking about what has also been done to children of those victims. They, are, they remain without a breadwinner. Probably that person was actually a breadwinner and they remain without a breadwinner. And they fail to get uh, parental love. And that's the extent that this violence actually affects citizens. And this is why I was saying we could actually have complementary roles in attending to this. Where we are able to say, there has been violence in this place. 
And this is the evidence that we have got that violence has actually taken place. As government, you've got a responsibility of ensuring that human rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled by the state. But then, when we then have this love-hate type of a relationship, it makes it very difficult because everything that we put across there, they see it as not being true. For a long time before 2008, there was always denial of the existence of violence. But when you then go to the global political agreement, there was an acknowledgement that violence actually exists. And unless there is acknowledgement of political violence existing and human rights violations existing, there is no way that any actor will actually be able to address that situation. What do we have what the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission? Is it not useful in addressing these issues? Um, they have been in existence for a while now. Um, my dream is actually to see them do more. We haven't seen that much in terms of what they have been able to do. Is, is there confidence in them? I think confidence could be built by seeing um, actions being taken. From the issues that you spoke about, the children that are growing after having suffered that violence, witnessed it in some instances where young, young children have witnessed their mothers and fathers being beaten up. Are we building an angry nation? There is um, what I might call generational um, anger that's going on. And as a nation, if we do not deal with that timeously, it's actually a time bomb in the making. Um, I think attention needs to be brought to those issues because it has got other tentacles that are affecting Zimbabweans in terms of them being able to exercise and enjoy the constitutionally guaranteed human rights. I will speak about a situation um, if we look at what happened in Matabeleland and the Midlands in terms of Gukurawind? We have children who grew up without birth certificates. And that situation is also affecting their families. And as we are getting to an election, we are also affected by that situation because we have a whole huge number of Zimbabweans who will be disenfranchised because they are undocumented. Some of them then travel to South Africa uh, seeking uh, better living conditions. Uh, they go and get married there. But because they are unregistered here, they are irregular migrants. And when they get there and have children, some of them are bringing their children back to Zimbabwe to their parents without any documentation. And those children are failing to go through school because grade, at grade seven, they will require a birth certificate for the child for them to be able to sit the grade seven um, exams. What we are seeing is young children who are now getting into artisanal mining and other ills that are affecting society at this stage. So there are huge issues that have been inherited by the young people in our society. And that anger needs to be dealt with among those young people. How, how do you break this case? How do you break this chain to make things normal for our nation? We need to be able to sit down, let the truth be told in terms of how things actually happened. I am sure out of that we will actually be able to then um, move forward um, because there is no way that anyone can move forward with their life until they have been told the truth about what happened to them.
President Emerson Mnangagwa is trying to do this through uh, his meetings with Matebelen and Collective, wouldn't you say? Um, I would actually think that that process should have started uh, a long time ago. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not sure in terms of the model that is being used to address this situation. Uh, I think in the last one I had that he met with the chiefs and the chiefs from the Midlands were left out. But the Midlands was also affected in the same way. Why are some people being left out, out of this conversation? It's the right way to go for the chiefs to be involved in this conversation because you might be aware that uh, some of them had actually said they were not going to allow the NPRC to deal with that situation. It was either they would have their own, the Kukurawundi Commission, or as the chiefs, they would actually need to be involved to be able to deal with the situation. So it's important that everyone um, is involved uh, in these uh, in these talks. Do you have hope? Do you have faith that something can actually happen so that we heal the wounds of the past and the present? I am sure that if we shift from not being sincere to actually being sincere in terms of solving the problems before us, I'm sure that we have got an opportunity or a possibility to see this situation um, addressed. Um, but I think at the same time, issues that affect Zimbabwe should also be put forward to the Zimbabweans to be able to participate in. All voices need to be, to be held mm -hmm. in terms of um, being able to solve because um, there is no way that we can be able to speak on behalf of those who have been affected. We need to directly um, involve them in that conversation so that they can give their point of view, even in terms of how that should be resolved. You, you say we should move to being sincere. Who is insincere in this, in this equation? Um, like I said, I think the NPRC has been in existence for a while now and we had hoped that by the time we get to this year, something would have started happening. But uh, there seems to be something still stopping the movement in terms of ensuring that these issues are addressed with the truth, the truth that uh, they require for them to be resolved. Some, some members in the civil society have also challenged the commissioners in the NPRC. Do you think that there is base for that? Um, I actually think so. I think uh, when we look at uh, the commissioners, they also need to have the integrity that goes with the role that they are playing um, out there. I want to come to, to you, Justina. You, you are a news anchor, the face of the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. Mm -hmm. How did you move from that to being a human rights defender? I was influenced by what happened in my tabellaland. When I left the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, I joined... Um, an independent or private radio station, Voice of the People. And uh, my work there entailed going into the communities and speaking to people about what had happened to them. The tales that I had in Matabeleland, because when the massacres were happening in Matabeleland, I was still quite young. Um, and uh, I remember sitting in a round hut at some homestead and being told um, some of the things that happened. 
I felt that I could actually make um, more contribution in terms of highlighting human rights abuses and also being able to amplify the voices of those affected by human rights violations. And so that was the movement that happened for me um, moving from journalism to um, civil society. Yeah. So you, you tell me about you realizing about these serious issues when you moved to the voice of the people. Now, how, how did you fail to realize this when you were working for a journalistic org organization in ZBC? Actually, the reason why I left the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation was a change of editorial policy that happened from about 2000. Um, I think when I started, we were guided by ethics, which I actually saw uh, melting away as we got to the year 2000. Somehow there was some control in terms of what could be covered by the Zimbabwe Broadcasting um, Corporation and what could not be covered. And so it was not adequately captured. So those voices were not coming through. Actually, um, I don't remember um, the number of times I was able to mention the, the term Gukuraund while I was an anchor at, uh, at, ZB, at Z, ZBC. What does this do to the fabric of the nation when a national broadcaster has such censorship issues? Um, I think what it does is that it just takes away a lot from them uh, in terms of being trusted to uh, be a voice of authority because people will listen with another ear listening elsewhere um, because uh, there are things that are edited out that you actually maybe at times you um, you witness uh, people talking about but then they never make it to the news it depends on who is at the center of um, the news article and there are some incidents that happen that never make it to the public broadcaster and for me that's an issue that we need to be um, dealing with because they are supposed to be a public broadcaster and they are supposed to be informing the nation and also educating the nation but then if the information and the education are coming in um, what can diluted there is a bit of a challenge there what what did this do to your conscience when you were there i will talk about one situation that um, contributed to my making my decision that uh, that would actually be my last it was June 2000. I was um, an anchor on for the flagship bulletin at 8. Uh, we were going towards an election in the year 2000. Um, Morgan Changirai had just had a rally in Mutari. I think it was covered, if not less than 30 seconds. Um, and then the late Dumiso Dabengwa, was Minister of Home Affairs at the time. And you know Home Affairs also deals with archives. And uh, there was a spot for him where he spoke for nearly three minutes. And uh, I felt that the editor should have given priority to the rally because Zimbabweans were supposed to be informed about a special event which was elections coming on and for me it just didn't make sense i asked the producer and he said that was the instruction that they had received and for me it was time up is this where you became the enemy of the state i suppose maybe that's when i became an enemy of the state having 
uh, moved from the private, from the public broadcaster into um, civil society. We, we have we have had your story, Justina, about how you were abducted, how you were kept in communicado. But I just want us to go to the present. Mm -hmm. How does that past experience affect you today, or you have healed from it? You can never heal from that, uh, blessed. Um, I have had therapy sessions. But obviously, therapy sessions are meant to help me cope, but never to erase what happened. It's a traumatic event that I um, experienced, um, and therefore, it's not easy to just block it. And when situations like that come up, it's normal for someone who has gone through that to also walk the same road going back to the day that I was abducted. Um, this is history or a situation or an experience that I will have to live with. I have gone through therapy for me to be able to cope, but um, there are times when I feel that I am really low because of that um, situation. But there are times as well that I'm able to also um, participate in everything around me. Um, but really, I think the bottom line is that can never be erased. Do you sometimes lose sleep? Of oh yes, oh yes. Especially when there, is, when there are incidences of abductions. Um, what it does to my mind um, is also a fear of a repeat of that situation. So that's something that uh, happens quite naturally. You, are you angry? I think I have shifted from being angry um, to a situation where I am thinking that I could be an advocate for the truth to be told and for people to account for their actions. Because as long as people are allowed to perpetrate violations with impunity, as Zimbabwe, we will remain uh, in the hole that we are in and our human rights record will never improve. I, I, I listened to you read the statement on the abduction of Tatenda Mombeara and your voice is crystal clear as a broadcaster mm -hmm. for my news anchor. Mm -hmm. But on that instant, it wasn't. It wasn't blessed because these are situations that take me back to the 3rd of December when I went through a harrowing experience which I believe I did not deserve. I still have to have someone sit in front of me and tell me that you deserved what we gave you for reasons one, two, three. But I do not think that I deserved what I got because I had not committed a crime. Working in civil society is not a crime. Working in civil society is just having a big ear and a big mouth to be able to listen to what is happening in communities and also amplify the voices of, um, of communities. But I think there are people who do not want the truth to be told. And I think that's why I found myself um, those 21 days in Comunicado when my family actually thought I had been killed. I also thought I was not going to come out alive. How did you feel you know, the emotions when you first saw light again? Well, I will tell you about a situation I was, when I was handed by my abductors to the police, uh, I was telling you about the police being complicit. 
uh, when I was handed over, they did not call my lawyer. They did not call my family. That the person you have been looking for, by the way, the police had also put um, an advert in the paper saying that they were looking for me. But when I was handed over by these people, these supposed people, they did not inform the people who had reported that I was missing. But one situation that really affected me was when my brother saw me at Matapi um, police station. I was so excited because they tortured me. Um, obviously that affected um, my body. But what I'm thankful for is that my spirit remained very strong. I was happy to see my brother. But when he set sight on me, he was really angry. At the end of the day, the police officer who had been kind enough because they had been given instruction that I was not supposed to be seen either by the lawyers or my family, eventually said, Mdara Wakuita noise. I have no option other than to ask you to leave because he really got emotional and that made me very uncomfortable i didn't understand here is your sister you have not seen for weeks and the emotion that went with that was just out of this world um, and i think the sight of seeing my mother my mother and my son um, i think you might be aware of the fact that i would come to court in handcuffs and leg irons, um, that just affected me emotionally you were, more than anything. You were the victim, but yes. you were the one in cuffs. I was the one in the dock. How did that feel in terms of looking at the at justice system, at the police? How did it feel to you? It was a terrible encounter, a terrible situation that I had to live with. Um, I am so grateful because we had a good team of lawyers. But um, everywhere along the way, the lawyers were also, they had obstacles. Uh, at times we would come to court at 8 in the morning and the case would also would only be had maybe from about 3 o'clock. And before a decision is made, you are told, no, it has been pushed forward to another day. And at the end of the day, I then concluded that it wasn't prosecution as such, but it was actually persecution. So if you are not strong, you can actually um, break down with that kind of a situation. With the experience that you have lived, do you think that there's justice in this country? I suppose it depends where you are in terms of justice. Um, I am aware that there are a lot of people who have not uh, seen justice in their cases in terms of the victims that I was talking about. But there are other victims who have seen some justice, but still there are gaps. I will talk about the situation of the people who were gunned down. Uh, the Mosante Commission said they needed to be compensated. Uh, but up to now, we are not aware of any family that has been compensated. They are still crying out for help. Um, and uh, I think there needs to come a time when the rights of citizens um, have to be prioritized ahead of everything else. You were, you were awarded compensation. Did it yes, ever sir. come? It did. A hundred and fifty thousand RTGS. Did it make sense to you? It did not, because at the time that we made the application, it was actually in US dollars. But uh, when that uh, strange situation happened, where the RTGS was likened to the US dollar. Um, I think the whole world kind of laughed at us to say, 
how can the RTGS be the same value as the US dollar? That was uh, the same time that uh, this compensation was paid. It took that long? It did. It was actually 10 years later. That they paid? Yes. Governments are supposed to protect the people, aren't they? They should. And the constitution demands that they do that. And respect the rule of law. Exactly. Did they respect the rule of law, paying compensation after 10 years, in your view? Um, I suppose what I will say is that uh, here is a case, uh, 2009, the constitutional court ruled in my favor. And uh, for principle's sake, I would say it's a case that's out there that has actually demonstrated that uh, the state can be challenged and uh, with success. Um, and also the fact that uh, people need to account for their actions. I suppose the disappointment is that those people who tortured me, the people who abducted me, have actually not accounted for their actions because this was uh, paid by government. But I do not believe that the people on whose behalf they paid were actually on official duty because I don't think anyone is employed to abduct and to torture and also to prevent citizens from being protected by the law. In short, you paid yourself? Yes, because I pay taxes. And the men who handed you over to the police, the police did not do anything to those men? They haven't done to that individual. They haven't... Actually, there was a certificate that, sign, that was signed by then Minister of State Security that those people were on official duty and they were not going to be um, put forward in terms of their names and, uh, and all that. If you were to meet the then Minister of State, uh, Dijma Simtasa, what would you want to say to him? I would want to find out why I was abducted because it was done by CIO who were, were under his ministry. It would actually be um, very good for me to understand the reason why I was targeted. As we, as we go towards closing, Justina, what do we need as a country to move past this inflicting of pain to our own? I think what we need as a nation is to recognize that above everything else, we are all Zimbabweans. And um, we need not see others as animals or people who are second class. Um, I think our leaders need to be able, I think I've said this, they need to tone down in terms of hate language. That is driving violence that their supporters eventually perpetrate on each other. Because I've spoken about intra-party and also inter-party violence. What would you say you know, if you had the opportunity to meet with Nelson Chamisa, the uh, Emerson Dambuzum Nangago, the president of this country, as we heard, because these are the two major protagonists as we head into an election, mm -hmm. apart from toning down, what mm -hmm. else can be done? I think what I would say to the two of them is that um, unless the environment is conducive for people to come out there, it is going to be impossible for them to get 5 million votes for ZANU-PF and 6 million votes for the MC MDC Alliance. And I'll ask you at this time to talk to the people of Zimbabwe, those who feel that they can't, there's no justice. 
those who feel that they've been let down by their government. Mm -hmm. You have been in worse, in the depth of the depth, mm -hmm. place that I wouldn't want to go. Mm -hmm. But you came up. Mm -hmm. What message can you give to the people of Zimbabwe? I think the message that I would give to the people of Zimbabwe is that the rights that are in Chapter 4 of the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights, are rights that they are supposed to enjoy and exercise. No one is supposed to obstruct them in terms of enjoying those rights. And I would also say that if those rights are violated, there is actually room for redress. They can actually um, approach the courts for redress. And uh, I think what I also want to say is that a lot has been said about civil society. We are not enemies of the state. We are patriotic Zimbabweans who love their country deeply and cannot stand to see our people suffer. And this is the reason why we want to speak out about those situations. And um, I'm really saying that there is no need for people to be working on strategies to silence us. They should actually create a conducive environment for us to complement what they are supposed to be doing. So what is, what is the, you know, what is the plan for as you cover 2023? What are you looking at? We are basically wanting to give citizens the agency mm -hmm. to say, you know, we work with monitors. But we, were, we are extending it to general citizens to say resist, reject, and report violence using the SPEC application. Okay. Um, so what we are saying is if they recognize that a particular individual is violent, why take him to parliament? If they are violent, as your leader because you are not going to get anything he does not he or she does not have the integrity of becoming a leader as Zimbabweans we need to go back to having people look at the candidates on the ballot we want them to begin to look at the merits of those people being there and we move away from people just thinking that if it is MDC then we give it a tick if they are also violent, we are saying reject them. Because as Zimbabweans, we do not want violent leaders. Have you engaged, are you engaging with the police because they, they're the ones who would like probably pay, play a major role in the election? Um, I'm not sure if the situation is going to change before the elections. But in the run-up to the 2018 elections, we had a very good relationship with the police. The National Elections Command, mm -hmm. Makoza was the uh, assistant commissioner leading that. Yes. Um, and you know, the first time that we said we wanted to go and pay a courtesy call, we ended up being very embarrassed because we were esteemed um, visitors to the police. And that had never happened before. And we actually thought it was a start of a good working relationship. We worked quite well in the run-up to the elections. Just after the elections, they were disbanded. And now we are writing letters to the police. There is no response. And I think as an organization, we are thinking we need to use other methods for them to be able to listen to us. I remember one time we wrote to the Commissioner General asking about the murders around artisanal mining, mm -hmm. where we were talking about the machete gangs. Mm -hmm. We wanted them to confirm if what we were hearing, they were also hearing. Rather than to confirm or deny if they had heard it, 
they actually came here and were starting to profile me as if I had committed a crime. And the chairperson of the board said, but it's not the director who wrote you that letter. He was, the, cha the chairperson was the one who signed the letter. They said, because you hear Justina Mkoko, you think you just need to now start persecuting. You can't profile it. Why are you profiling it? Why are you not giving us information that we have asked you for? Because you are supposed to be a public office that we use. I remember in one election, we had observers from Botswana. One of the women, as we were talking about the police, said, I'm recognizing Zimbabweans that your police are not your friends. We want to have the police becoming our friends. And maybe if they transform from being a force to being a service, they will actually be looking at things differently. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we hope that uh, you will work well. We hope so too. And that we will get information as well from yeah. you readily. That is if we, they do not find cells for us at Chikuru. <laughs> we'll still get information from the cells. <laughs>